do the thing and everybody knows that we're about to talk about the weird things baby and they're gonna be super weird you thought we were weird back before guess what now the goblins are fucking the monkeys Uh, Andrew, you, you never had a particular affinity to the Fallout franchise, did you? Um, no. I mean, I know that people like it. I, as, as a dimwit who looks at the commercials and the things that go around it, like, uh, what's the thing, the pal, the little things, like all the paraphernalia, I, I appreciate it. <laughs> oh, it you mean way. the, uh, the Pip-Boy? <laughs> yeah, Pip-Boy, that's it. Yeah, that thing's that cool. I think that stuff's cool. Um, uh, the trailers. Are we live? Are we yeah, live? Yeah, yeah, we're live. Says? We're live. You could shit Man, all Eli over. Roth loves Guardians of the Galaxy. Uh, <laughs> oh, is Fallout Eli Roth? No, yeah. uh, Fallout is Westworld. Oh, no, no, the series. I'm sorry, I'm thinking of Borderlands. Yeah, no, Fallout, the Fallout series. No, I, Fallout looks interesting to me. Uh, that looks interesting to me. Um, uh, yeah, I was thinking of Borderlands. You know, Fallout, I think that the... That I found more interesting engaging in Borderlands is it is a non player. Uh, the, the uh, the, the part that got me the uh, number one baby Billy is the yeah, Walter Goggins. I mean, come on, right? Yeah. Uh, and then number two, uh, robot surprise voice from uh, uh <laughs> from Toast of London, uh, <laughs> it was amazing. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, you guys just want to dive in? Let's well, yeah, are we gonna start? All right, here we go in three, two. Hello, and welcome to the Weird Things Podcast. I'm your name, joined by Brian Brushwood. Hello, hello. Mr. Justin Robert Young. Well, hello, friends. How are you? Fantastic. So uh, a couple interesting items in the news today, and start off by going into one of them. Uh, boom. You know, that aerospace company called Boom. Oh, I, 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 I think oh, I remember. I, I, I thought you were about to finish the sentence with goes the dynamite. Mm. Go on. Yeah. No. So I, I think I think if I remember, there was a situation with them where they the rocket didn't quite get all the way up. No, Boom. Boom's different. That was that was uh, <laughs> uh, enough about that person's problems, Justin. Uh, Boom is trying to make a supersonic plane. Ah, and got you. So their goal is to kind of bring back supersonic flight. There are a lot of things standing in the way, but they're like, hey, it's 2024. You know, if a you know bunch of Frenchies and Europeans achieved supersonic flight 50 years ago, maybe we should do that now, of course, in light of the state of uh, European airplane manufacturing compared to U.S. I don't know if I would sort of, you know, come off on my high horse like that right now, given, you know, what's going yeah. on. Well, uh, well, 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 I, I, I thought U.S. had the lower hand with all of our failures with the 737 MAX. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. I, I wouldn't yeah. be so. Oh, okay, okay. Boeing, it, Boeing, it, Boeing is in the exact. mud right now. Air, Airbus yes, right. is in a Got it. Sorry. Are, I, 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 so I thought you were saying so. that, that, that it was uh, Airbus yeah. that was making the move. Go ahead. No, I'm then saying I wouldn't. No, 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 not at all. I think that 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 when you have websites are like, "Hey, am I on a Boeing?" Um, not not a good sign for the state of commercial aircraft in the United States. So that being said, uh, I, and I was you know saying that how previously we could be dismissive of all oh, the Europeans. Well, uh, their stuff seems to be holding together and flying when it comes to commercial aircraft. So anyhow, Boom is trying to build their supersonic airliner, and they just had their first successful test flight. It wasn't a supersonic flight, but it was actually a test flight of they basically built a scaled down version of the aircraft using similar avionics, similar carbon fiber composite, uh, you know, composition, I, I guess, you know, a single engine. And they got it up to like 230 some miles an hour. didn't fall apart. We're able to land it again. And they're going to slowly start increasing the flight envelope to eventually they're going to go Mach one. Well, and, and so maybe we shouldn't 
lump them in in category America, given the fact that they're kind of no, starting from no, scratch. No, 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 <laughs> and, no, no. and not, not just, with the I entanglements. Just, <laughs> no, I'm here. I, I, no, they're all American. Andrew, don't run from it. <laughs> Don't run from it. Uh, uh, yeah, no, I think that's probably a silly way to, to, to categorize this. <laughs> so uh, uh, w- w- where, where do we think, you know, the, the, the timeline on this is? The, the, I assume that they are trying to create kind of a new class of uh, uh, freight or passenger air that, that would seem to be the biggest market. So their biggest, I think, the, they have commercial agreements in place with Japan Airlines. And the goal is to build a plane called the Overture, which will carry between 64 and 80 passengers at Mach 1.7. And basically, which is about twice the speed of today's subsonic airliner. So that's pretty darn fast. And the goal is to take it across, you know, particularly Japan Airlines to be able to do like Pacific crossings and stuff where you don't have to worry about, you know, the problem is, is like we have laws preventing like supersonic crossings in the U.S., et cetera, which uh, there are multiple reasons why that was put in place. Some people argue it was just to prevent Concorde from just devastating the entire U.S. aircraft industry uh, by uh, doing domestic uh, flights. Qu- a quick question. Once you go supersonic, does the sonic boom follow you the entire time or is it just one moment of a sonic boom or like – because I, I could totally understand why America would not be a fan of just this rolling thunder that comes across. But but if you could like get out to the Atlantic and then hit supersonic and then keep going, no, they're no, they're continuously because you're you're still going mock and as you're snap breaking that air of that right, okay. sound, right. as I understand it. Yeah, no, that makes sense. I, the moment I asked the question, I thought that's probably why the Concorde's not around. <laughs> Well, the, I mean, there's the argument that because at that time the U.S. was trying to create their own supersonic plane, and then that stalled. And then some people argue that we we passed legislation to slow down the Europeans on be able to do that. So I don't know that it's true, but they say so. They, um, but but I mean, it, it's it's one. I think it's it's a testament to how sophisticated and great the Concorde was. You know that they they and remember, do you remember why the the nose pointed down? Uh, oh my goodness. I used to know, uh, it, it, it was, I think it was deliberately to slow it down or no. Um, it's literally because to allow the pilots to see the runway. Oh, because once they get to a certain place, they don't need to see Jack nothing. Just go ahead, make it fast. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and that's a thing where, you know, uh, it just literally was because at that point, that's how that's how pretty sophisticated the Concord was. Is that the avion? I mean, the 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 power system, propulsion system, all this stuff was really like really advanced. But you didn't have reliable CRTs or displays that you would feel comfortable putting those in the cockpit or the avionics. Like you literally, like, well, we'll make the nose move so they can see the runway. <laughs> that's amazing. Just a straight up mechanical fix. Like might as well, yeah. might as well have duct tape on it. <laughs> but I mean, it, it, it's the there. You know, it, there was kind of a questionable record about like you know how long they run, how safe they were, et cetera. It's also you ever see the interior of a Concorde? Uh, no, but I do remember my dad telling me that uh, he had heard from. I think he flew on the Concorde once, and it, it's surreal that. The sides are literally very, very hot because you're going so fast. It's unpleasantly hot to get a window seat on a Concorde. Yeah. Yeah, it's like it's I never flew, but I mean, it's from appearances. It's like flying on a much smaller jet because it's a smaller tube. You know, the profile is much smaller. So but, you know, let's uh, let's go to our friend chat gpt here and let's go use the uh wolfram alpha plugin um and i'm gonna ask let's see how fast wolfram. here uh while you're doing that justin yes have have you noticed that like by and large most people like ask very bad questions of chat gpt like they they go straight for the ending. They're all like, uh, 
uh, I want an ad campaign for uh, milk and then whatever. And it's like, uh, I keep having to remind them, you begin with, hello, Chad GPT. Do you know what milk is? Please do some research on the milk environment. <laughs> please, please mm, mention blank, blank, and blank. We're about to, you, you got to tease it. You got to tease it out of them. And, and I find that most people don't get that. Agreed. I, <laughs> but I, w- I would say I would say that some. That's another I, cool I, I start, thing about you. No, no, no. <laughs> I I start. I will start if I think it's an out. I have a pretty good understanding of what it knows. I mean, like, as much as you could probably have. But like, I start a conversation out with, "Hey, uh, what do you know about topic A?" Right, and then and then I get it to there. But then then I'll go like, "Okay, let's go dive into this, and then go do that." So I will. I'll prep a bit. A part of it is, is that I knew when working on the prompts, it was very easy for me to be like, well, this works. This must be the way to do it. But then I would go back and pull things out of it and to see how efficient I could get. Uh, because it just, I think that, I think you said, Brian, like one of the points I, you know, you know, amplify there is like, you really want to break things down. You want to break tasks yeah. down because these things are not mind readers. And it's the same as talking to an employee or something like that is let's find out our shared reference point. Now let me list out the you know the the details about that. Uh, I put out a post last week about or week before about prompting um, vision models because there was a research paper that came out that they were getting not so good results with GPT four with vision. And I looked at their prompt and I'm like, you you need to tell it when you're giving it an image is you really want to tell it, hey, first look at the scene, figure out everything in the scene, then give me an answer. And then you, I was able to increase the efficiency of what they're doing by a hundred percent, like getting way more effective out of this, but there's a limit. And then I put out an article yesterday, which I go more into vision and then talk about some about prompting, but we can talk about that later. But I think Brian, like your point, yes, I think that the goal is, you know, when you create GPTs, like these special cases that you could sort of make them solve those problems for people because remember remember what prompting was like when we first had access to gpt3 in 2020 i mean i mean to be honest what it make what it still feels like and i think we're getting out of it it feels like stage hypnosis it starts like we agree on this yes excellent we can imagine this yes okay okay all right now here's what i really want now that we have a shared vocabulary yeah, and I guess what I'm saying is that, that when it started was that you there was no training on the original GPT-3 of like, hey, you're a bot. You've got to answer questions. It was literally blog post on milk strategy campaigns. Yeah. Idea number one. And it would go, oh, I'm gonna com- I'm gonna complete this. Uh so the Wolfram Alpha GPT has not answered yet to me. So I've just used Wolfram Alpha. And the answer I got was, um, did not answer. So I'm just using straight up. Let's just go. Let me just get, well, let's what get are it. we solving for here? I, I, I think I think Andrew wants to figure out exactly how hot the outside of the Concord. Oh, got. not even that. I'll just figure out how fast it would get there. I could have done this with basic math. So <laughs> um, I'm just asking Chat GPT straight up, and I even use Wolfram Alpha for that. Um, So it's calculating the time time. It created a formula to figure out how long it'll take us to get from LA. It would take 4.2 hours. So four hours and 15 minutes to go from LA to Tokyo on board. Oh, damn. I thought you were going to do LA to New York. I'm like, well, that's not all that good, but uh, uh, LA to to, to Tokyo. That's, that's, that's excellent. I mean, uh, normally that's a 10 hour. 10 hour flight now 10 or oh, yeah, yeah like 12 I or thought. 12 yeah. yeah i think it was yeah it was around there when we went i i, I know to tokyo yeah uh, uh, uh the Haneda. we uh i think we spent like an hour on this program previously talking about uh elon's pitch of you know basically getting to um tokyo in 15 minutes with a wild roller coaster ride are we still optimistic about that with with, um, with Starship, I mean, it depends on what time frame, but it, uh, be one point eight hours. It's like an hour fifty minutes to do LA to New York City at, at supersonic speeds. Yeah, Mo- yeah, wait, 1. Wait, 7. yeah. Which would which would take that from you know now 
what like San Francisco to LA is is about that. So like like a a San Francisco to LA flight would now become an LA to New York uh flight. I mean it would revolutionize cross country travel. So to I because of the sonic boom, I think that we're going to want to go towards some more stratospheric flight. I think that's going to be the thing we're going to want to do. You know, you can talk about flight paths, things like that, avoiding that stuff, but it only gets to a point where you're just trying to build a system or build a method that lets you navigate through things that are going to be regulatory complicated. As far as are we going to be hopping into starships and, you know, doing crossing the Pacific or going from point to point? Um, I, in a long enough timeline, something like that, I think is true. I, you know, I'm in the middle of working on an article talking about what an AI driven economy really means and, and trying to get it, avoid any wish fulfillment, or if we just enact this policy, whatever, but like straight up, if we just continue the path we are with mental intervention, where do we end up? And yeah, I see a point where that makes sense. That becomes practical, but it's really hard to see that from where we are right now. You know, when part of the point of the article is to explain that like, I've used this example before, but I was looking at statistics like in 1838 was the first time a photograph was taken of a person and it was by accident because somebody stood on a street getting their shoe shined while the camera was on. Um, but in 1838, if you tried to tell that person what the future would be, you know, or where we would, where, what our present would be like. They one, wouldn't to... have possibly predicted that birth of a nation would win an Academy Award. <laughs> Eh, maybe they would have. You know, they, but, they might have. Uh, no, that, 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 that might have been the only one. Yeah. I, it, whatever it was, uh, you know, Woodrow Wilson's favorite film. Yeah. Yeah. Not exactly. Okay. What, what, was, it, was it as controversial then as we should still, have been? Still, still the name of the best director award. Anyway, go on. <laughs> Moving on. Yeah, yeah. So they, it would be hard for them to understand motion pictures. And then the example I give is let alone, you know, what a guy like James Cameron does where he makes these motion pictures take place mostly inside of a computer. Or the fact that the budget for his film, the budget for Avatar, was greater than the U.S. defense budget in 1838, not adjusted dollars, okay? Uh, the gross was greater than the GNP of the United States in 1838, you know? And that's the thing. And the number of people who worked on, you know, the number of people who worked on Avengers Endgame was more than half the size of the entire U.S. Army in 1838. So, so when I, you're thinking I, from I've heard a few people... Uh, describe the experience of watching some of the classic 3D movies uh, in in the Apple Vision Plus. Um, uh, I have to, in my experience, when you go to a movie theater, it's like there's a screen and then you put on sunglasses and now everything is half as bright. Uh, I got to imagine that like two lenses dedicated to uh, giving you the most immersive experience is superior. Have, have, is... Our 3D Have movies you watched much Avatar better? 2 with your Apple Vision Pro? Yeah, man, this just went a completely different direction. I was going. I was going to say. Cool I'm like, so the economic thing about, okay, well, let's talk about the stereoscopic movie. Yeah, it's, it looks cool. It looks very cool to watch it with the Apple Vision Pro than stereoscopic. You understand how bad every other 3D movie is because it's not true 3D. It's They use a post-process. So you watch an Avengers movie and Scarlett Johansson is just like a flat plane against another plane. They just cut out... It's just not good uh, when it's not real 3D. Uh, it's also heavy. Like you just sit there and like, cool, I'm going to put this on my head for, well, you won't, you won't have to worry about it for your head for three hours because the battery will run out. So. <laughs> play, uh, play. On a plane, it's great because it kind of drags your head down and you. Can we, can we, get, can yeah. we get back to some of the, the, the economic stuff of just kind of where, where we're going in terms of, of AI? It, it, it does appear to me that I, I don't, know the further we get into this how much more bullish i can be on even just the applications of where we are with our modern world of uh, uh, uh ai just just figuring out how we can use these tools right now better let alone the stuff that is coming down the pike and i can only imagine that that has an economic effect yeah i, I bring up an example of you know we we probably waste you know, you know, collectively, you know, probably in the in our country, you know, a, over a billion hours a year filling out forms. Yeah, you know, like three hundred million people. The amount of time we spend filling out forms is not 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 a, not a probably an exaggeration. Like what mandatory process that we're all going to have to go through in the next few weeks would uh, uh, be an example of us wasting a lot of time filling out forms. 
Yeah, and, <laughs> that would be and, relevant. Oh, coming up on April fifteenth. <laughs> and I think that if you built a, these are problems solvable by AI right now. Like, like yes. literally, you could reduce the amount of time that you have to do to fill out a form. I would say by ninety percent. We we see that with attempts like autocomplete and Google Chrome or Safari to try to say, hey, I already know this stuff. I I can do this things. Every year I have to fill out a big thick sheaf of tax forms for foreign taxes and stuff. And these things aren't even, nobody even bothered to put them into, you know, uh, one of these online document things. Like they get, I get sent paper copies of this. Yeah. And, and I'm like, man, like I, if I had, the, if I wasn't involved in 12 other things, I would probably take every government form I could find, put it into an online, you know, repository and let you use an AI to fill this thing out and send you the, the, the formal copy. Um, those are things, those are low, easy, 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 you know, we have OCR, which is way, way better now. I do a thing in my latest blog post, I talk about using, there's an API with uh, OpenAI's vision, you know, the GPT worth vision to use that. Other companies have, you know, Google has one, uh, Anthropic Cloud has their own vision capable models. I also explain like, don't use the tiny one for OCR because it only has 85 tokens and there's 300 words on your page. It won't get them. But you know, my point is, yeah, we could, we could take a GPT-4 level model and automate away a ton of stuff. Yeah. Yeah, it's the top post. I don't uh, Brian, go look at the top post there and if click on, I don't know if you recognize the reference there. Um, um, I don't know if I do get the reference. We're looking at a 3D plane with a little robot and I gave it instruction, which was to find the butter. Uh, I, I oh, built oh, a 3D oh, oh, got it, got it, got it, got it. You, you made sure that the robot thing was from Rick and Morty. <laughs> what yeah, is my I used, purpose? I, I created a 3D simulator <laughs> that people can download and run, which uses GPT-4 to guide a robot across a plane to understand that. Um, and I used the uh, Rick and Morty butter robot as the 3D <laughs> model in there. Oh, God. Your, your oh my is, God. <laughs> you can go, there's a video down there. You can click on it. You're, you give the instruction, find the butter, and it just roams around there until it finds the butter. Just powered by <laughs> GPT-4V. Uh, <laughs> Which yeah, keep going. This is amazing. Um, <laughs> there's a yeah, there's a video of uh, keep going, keep wow, going. Wow, this is a going. big post. Yeah, I know. I want it. The, there you go. There we go. All right, so we got yeah, a toaster, wanted... we got a butter, we got a butter slicing bot, uh, and we've got south and east and a cup. Uh, I assume that there's some kind of audio that goes along with this. No, it's, it's just 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 a. a... So I gave it the okay. instruction, find the butter. And so in this case, it's just bouncing around like a Roomba for now. Well, it, it's using vision. It, it's using vision to take this. So it, it, takes a, it takes a screenshot, uploads it to GPT-4, and then it starts to look for, you know, where the butter. I just given it that direction. I faced it north. So now it's actually running. So the AI is now controlling it. And it basically starts moving closer towards a target. Holy moly, you image. even made a, a picture in picture window of what the robot's point of view is as it tries to yep. find the butter. Yeah, and you could switch it and only send that to the AI, but I, you know, it's, it's, if it doesn't see anything, it doesn't know where to go. And it gets telemetry, it just says I'm facing north, south, east, or west. That's it. So GPT 4 has to guess entirely based upon the image you're looking at, how to guide that to there with a very simple prompt. Um, the thing that takes one of the longest things in there is that actually, this is, a, you a realize point, but... you're actually Rick Sanchez at this point, you actually yeah. created a robot that was smart enough to understand the world around it, but, uh, tortured enough to realize that its entire purpose was to cut butter. Listen, man, we get inspiration where we can. <laughs> Uh, but the, back to the other conversations, yeah, I think that there's so much low-hanging fruit out there for applying things. Like, you know, we have OpenAI has their optical character, has, excuse me, there's Vision, which is OCR. Anthropic has Claude, which is really good and like super, super cheap to run for tasks like this. There's so many things that we could be automating right now that would just, you know, we could be, we could, if nobody developed a new AI model for several years, we could be finding all sorts of ways to get, you know, improve productivity out of what we have now but oh, but fun fact they're not stopping they're going to keep getting better i mean i mean that that's the thing right is is that uh uh, 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 uh fox news alert uh ai keeps getting faster 
faster than humans can be bothered to figure out how awesome it is and what to use it for. Well, but that's that's the big key in terms of economic impact is that we're just now like we've gotten to the first 5% in my opinion of just understanding how powerful essentially free transcription is. Like there's we 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 haven't even started to scratch the surface of all the applications that can happen from something that's been fairly standard in in in, in the world of AI development for a, a little a little bit now. Like th this is this is uh, uh, the further it goes, it's not like we're going to continue to be befuddled. We're just going to be learning the lessons of people who apply this stuff that we're all still just wrapping our head around in terms of an application. So la last night, um, it, it, by the way, I, 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 we're all pretty savvy, I would like to think, on uh, the AI revolution. But when I describe... Some, some savvier than others. Uh, yes, for the correct. <laughs> uh, but when I describe to people, uh, you know, hey, something, something AI, and they're all like, yeah, I think it'll be good for, or, you know, writing this, writing that. And I'm like, hmm. Uh, last night, uh, I, I, I was talking to what who I consider pretty sophisticated storytellers. And I was like, do you realize that overnight, Andrew Main created uh, an engine that allowed... 22 points of contacts, uh, contact to be reduced to one. Everything from the title to the summary to the album art to uh, uh, to understanding who the characters are and uh, to the uploading and all of that stuff. And they uh, it, very clearly they had never even encountered that. And then and then my slam dunk is when I say, I asked Andrew if he wanted to sell this product. And Andrew's response was, uh, the product itself can do, can create this product. <laughs> like, <laughs> like that, that's, that's the part that people don't understand. Is that how, that's how fast everything is happening. Yeah. And that's the, you know, talk about our podcast uploading tool. And, and, and that's one of the things I really encourage people who are trying to develop applications is don't develop in the vacuum. Unless just want to do that curiosity talk to people with real world problems and yes. then look at what tools are there to solve it. And talking to Brian who has to do the, take on the full burden of after the show finishes and, you know, you know, his company has to get this stuff uploaded, take care of all that, handle that. Any, any minute that he or one of the people working for him is spent doing this instead of something else is a minute taken away. And, you have to, you start thinking like, like, where does automation come in? Part of the problem is sometimes is we want to change the way people do things. Like here's this entirely new environment where you do a thing like, okay, what I want is a button. I just want a button to press to do that. And the closer you get to the button, the better. And the more immediate you make the button to the person even better. And what we're seeing now, things are moving so fast. Like I said, like, yeah, I created this, this uploader, but I'm like, yeah, like I, I don't know that there's a real market for this thing. I mean, there might be in a short period of time where people might sign up because it makes it easier, but this, and I could be wrong. I've over, I've, I've often overestimated how quickly things come to market, but you're going to be the next generations of chat GPT like systems are just going to be able to say, do this for me and yeah. save this work. For you, me. you will be able to make that lazy statement and you won't have to, coach it along piece by piece. You'll just be able to yeah. say, hey, I got a podcast. Check out the podcast. Well, I think, I think that the, it, it might help clarify for you. It might make you a clearer question asker, uh, you know, either on, on the back end or the front end. But I do think that, like, one of the things that Andrew, I think, has very rightly pointed out, not only in AI, but coding, is, like, clarity is huge. And I think that, that advancements in AI will be focusing on that. We'll, we'll be we'll be focusing on trying to get clarity out of things. So there's a lot of big uproar happened in the coding world because a company, Cognition Labs, which I can send you the link to. Sure. There that we've talked a bit before about the next big thing is going to be agents. You know, the idea of it's not just you know not just ChatGPT trying to solve a problem. It's when you see ChatGPT serving the you know searching the web or trying to do stuff like that. 
And what that means is the idea is it goes, it gets a response from the world and it takes that response, analyzes it, and then it goes, tries to do you know, the next step and the next step and the next step. It's like first, you know, go to reddit.com and create an account. And then it goes in there and figures out the page and does that and says, okay, I've got an account. Now I do my next thing. So uh, some developers have been using, created a system called Devon. This is Cognition Labs, which I believe is powered by probably GPT-4 under the hood. And their demo was basically, a, and it's kind of an interesting workspace where like, hey, uh, here's the task. I need you to go build blank. And you watch this system just go run and go to the web, create accounts, do research, do all this thing and start iterate and accomplish the task. And this is going to be, I think what they're doing is cool, but it's like, it's going to be the norm. Yeah. You know, you're going to see this like, you know, uh, as a big thing. So software developers have like gone, oh boy, like this is, this is scary. And if you've been living in the agent world, you're like, well, yeah, this is cool. Uh, if you go uh, to the sh- bottom sh- one, go, What's to, that? go the, to the bottom one. Yeah. Go up. But like, there you go. Yeah. Devin's up work side hustle. Okay, cool. There we go. So they're basically said, uh, basically has tried to, have it um, giving it real jobs from Upwork and see if it could do those. Oh, oh God. Jeez, Louise. <laughs> oh, that's when you know it gets real. <laughs> yeah. When you're like, man, an intern could do this. Light bulb goes yeah. off. Ding. <laughs> uh, just absolute guess, Andrew. When does agent search traffic eclipse human search traffic? I don't know, cause like we we do so much just dumb. Like I still use a lot of, you know, if I want to search for a basic thing, you know, photos of, uh, you know, um, uh, rusty spotted cats. I just go use regular search. I don't need to yeah. do an agent based search for it. Uh, you know, we could measure it in the terms of data being delivered to people, like like the amount of data that's being used, our time spent on results and stuff. Uh, I don't know. Remember, like, we're e- our, e- us, our listeners, everybody here is so far ahead of the curve. Yes. And that, that you know, I don't know. Yeah, I, I would. The only reason why I would say that it is an, an, an inevitability is that if, you, if people have long term projects that they are working on things that that agents are constantly working, that that stacks exponentially. And and ultimately, there is only so many hours in the day in which a human can spend on the internet. So even if we imagine that we will continually be spending more time on the internet, either obliquely or directly, that, uh, uh, you know, it's, it, it, it's ultimately John Henry versus Inkipu. Well, I, 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 well, I, 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 I can speak to the oblique because I think both Andrew and I have talked about, um, inspirations that happen while we're on long walks and the ability to just say, Hey, go out, find out this kind of story or this kind of thing or this kind of problem and come back to me with pitches. And, 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 you know, meanwhile, we're being healthy walking around and then, and then you hit that moment of like, uh, of insight. Where you but create- that would be agent search, right? Yeah. Like, yeah, so, so yeah. that would be an example of like, okay, well you have that cooking, that's going to spend whatever time that you want it to cook or, or you're going to eventually have to pull it off the task to uh, uh, stop it. So that's humming in a way that you literally doing anything that you would do on the internet uh, uh, up to and including searching, uh, you would not be doing. You would be walking. Well, I would I would say that a thing that I thought about and talked about building for, you know, with friends is that we, we are stuck in this idea of what search is because of what Google can do and can't do. Like we don't think about search in ways that we really could, because we just know that either we we know this overtly or intuitively that search is just going to tell us what somebody else said about a thing. Yeah. And, and, and we don't really think about it. It's going to give us this idea of what a thing really is. So like I'm writing this article, I'm trying to make different points about stuff, but I'm doing a lot of search to do this and, and, and some chat GPT stuff, more complex stuff. At the end of it, I'm going to take my article, squeeze it into chat GPT and say, Hey, pull out everything I'm going to need to link to my sources on and make a list of sources. So I can then basically have that there, but save myself the trouble of having to like spend an hour Googling stuff. I, I, I say that's a huge, that's another thing, man. Like that people aren't even realizing like I, we have, we have, we have, we have, we have friends that 
like have outlets that you got dirty copy like and that is a something that you don't need to have anymore you have you have a resource for free that is better than any grammar highlighter better than any spell it, check and i justin and i put together a guide for journalists on using chat gpt because they just like what we just like these are basic things you can think to use it for and i've told you i've given it to a few other journalists and i've just gotten like really like oh wow this is great this yeah. is super useful um and and i'm like ah, this would seem obvious but no if you come at it from a different point of view it doesn't people just have this i don't know what the great the best word is but but Brian, you were circling around it, this idea that AI is a wish box. And yes. I make a wish, and then I open the box, and the thing that I wished for is in there. And, you know, you're not wrong, Walter, but but you are you are not right. This is, in, in its best form, exceptional, exceptional tooling. It is... It is uh, uh, it's uh, an extremely patient staff. And if you know how to work with the staff, you're going to get a lot out. But of also, it. it's like you need to know who you're asking for. You need to know what what what, what they're doing. And there's some things that it's okay at, and there's some things that it's like really good at. Right now, it's really good at transcription. Like for the price and the speed, it's next level uh, 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 to be able to do stuff. It's really good at copy editing. It's really good at stuff like understanding uh, 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 art and design in terms of basic rules of, of, of that kind of stuff. It's, it's, you know, uh, uh, if you just focus on that and you're, and you're, and you, we begin to chip out things in which it's not just a good multivitamin. It's very specifically nutritious in these ideas. Uh, that's where the businesses are going to come from. That's where the real effect on our culture, I, I think is going to be seen. And it, it's, it's increasingly good at context. Uh, it was really interesting last night. I was hanging out at the wizard Academy and uh, I never mentioned uh, what the wizard Academy was, but in the context of like, Hey, write me a, a screenplay for a summer blockbuster where Brian Brushwood meets this other guy. It knew it, it, it went and did the research, figured out who Brian Brushwood was went and did the research, figure out other guy. And then it wrote a scene. And then uh, the part that, that really got to me was like, oh, wait, it also knows what Wizard Academy is famous for being, is, is you know, a place uh, for uh, ideation and uh, 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 clever story writing and, and advertising and marketing and all that stuff. Yeah, it's, it's always sort of surprising when you realize how deep it can go. And I would say that, you know, problems of hallucination, other stuff, I think those are mitigatable, you know, not say use the word solvable, but like it is, it's just interesting. I think that we did like the first demo we did was, well, we are going through the podcaster tool and we're saying to like, you know, create like podcast art of like you and Justin and man, it was creating art that looked a lot like you and Justin. Yeah. Close enough for uh, AI work. It seemed beyond the realm of random. It seemed like, yeah. you know, and these are systems that are designed to try to not replicate people. But um, when you use mid journey or some of these other tools, you know, like, oh yeah, this is spot on, you know. I made Anthony Scaramucci as Modoc the other day, just for a joke. <laughs> <laughs> Nailed it. Yeah, well, I mean, given the, the reason... So, in other words, he just showed a picture yeah. of Anthony Scaramucci. <laughs> well, I just needed... I needed the head. I needed the floating head. That was what That was what I needed. There, there was a few that had a connected head, and I'm like, come on, Mid-Journey. You know that Modoc's a floating head. Come on. <laughs> All right. Go. I got a non-AI story for you. All hey! right. Well, probably probably well, the... Well, the well, well, hold on. Before we do that, let's remind everybody that Patreon.com slash Weird Things is where you need to go to support this show. Head on over there right now. Patreon.com slash Weird Things. Andrew, please. I got two wildlife stories for you, actually. Okay. okay. Uh, uh, you sometimes see a headline and you're like, man, uh, God is a WeirdThings.com fan. And, he's ah! just, <laughs> and then you I find out what, what the word goblin means. And then you oh, yeah. think, whoops. Oh. <laughs> uh, 
Maybe you saw this one. Uh, Montana man pleads guilty creating massive Franken sheep with cloned animal parts. I, I did. Saw, yeah, well, I did I think see you, this. I think you sent this to us. Somebody, yeah. somebody, I think in our group yeah, chat sent this yeah, to us. I, yeah. Uh, 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 yeah, this is awesome. So basically, what he did was he illegally imported certain animal parts from Asia, which their laws prevented you from bringing in different species because they're worried about you know them taking over ecosystem and stuff, and then uh basically use them to clone to create and then clone uh a hybrid sheep that would basically be much much bigger so people could he called it the uh, the montana mountain king or montana black magic so people could go hunt it um and basically because it was just going to give way more sport to it uh they arrested him because like hey you're importing animals i'm like i don't know that if importing Meat parts issue. yeah part for cloning is that really i mean the, the law exists to prevent like these things taking you know, certain things taking over an ecosystem i don't know that a giant sheep is <laughs> yeah, a risk. Yeah. basically he was correcting the cops where he's like well technically i imported meat that i used to clone to create an invasive species <laughs> But it wasn't really an invasive species, though. These it was just were... a ball and ass species. It was just a dope species. Sorry, sir, you're under arrest. Your species is too dope. Yeah, I, I, I would say that like, is any any mammal, you know, greater than fifty pounds, really a hard to manage invasive species? I don't know. I think we could kind of like hunt them down. Are, you know, well, talking well, about, like, hold on, uh, hold on, hold on. Are you are you playing coy or are you directly referencing? the feral hog problem that we have uh i mean what about 40 50 of them you ever think about that <laughs> coming at you yeah that's when you need an ar-15 yeah exactly <laughs> true facts I, brian we could solve the feral hog problem quickly we could how's solve that it very quickly. it's just non-stop hunting them <laughs> <laughs> but the problem is it's so fun to hunt them <laughs> that you yeah. just keep planting more of them yeah, that's my point. Is is it like we we could have solved that one a long time ago? You know, like I just so you were saying we go hog wild one summer and just totally knock them out. Yeah, I don't. You know, they're they're not hard to find. You know, so uh, we we have an. Issue I can't wait. Here. I can't wait into the president main administration. <laughs> just, oh, I, I, and I, I we're will, gonna take, take care of the feral hogs <laughs> by a brutal summer of nothing but nonstop pig death. Snake roundup, man. And we're gonna just you're gonna have. Hey, everybody's McRib is on the menu. Not forever. <laughs> America has two problems: not enough money, not enough McRibs. I'm solving them both with a subsidy program. <laughs> We I, I can do both. <laughs> my, I, if I was ever, which I would never would, because we stupid. I've told, I was explaining. My wife's like, "Here, without running for politics, I'm like, well, here's what I would do. I would become the most hated man if I she's like governor. I'd become the most hated governor ever. Yeah, because I would take every solution, like homelessness, whatever, and I would do the most extreme thing possible that you possibly could do, and to the point that I would get impeached and ran out of office. So I'd make it easier for the next person who comes along to get away with a lot more. I would shift the Overton window yeah. so far to the extreme <laughs> that the things we're afraid to do would be easier to do. Like, well, at least I'm not Andrew. Well, let <laughs> me know. Let me know when you do it, because I'll set up to run right after you. <laughs> exactly. You'll have your, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm picturing like a stadium arena, and it's like, whose fault is inflation? Feral hogs. <laughs> Whose fault is the military industrial complex? Feral hogs. Well, I mean, like, I'm, I'm, you know, if I was, you know, mayor of San Francisco, remember the show like Bait Car, where they go try, like, how do I, how do I stop car break-ins? Pretty easy if you want to, you know. But uh, a lot of things, a lot of solvable put, crimes out there. But promise you, guns in guy. cars. <laughs> try to break in that, but and then oh you, electrify him aye, 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 aye. trying to get in there can't electrification of the car would you uh okay just throwing this out here yeah a lot of people upset about what this. does an electrified car look like on the apple vision pro 
lot of people upset about this border crisis immigration thing. Would you support or not support the idea of uh, Decepticons uh, just just all up and down the border? Giant, 50-foot-tall mechanical robots. Uh, I mean, I, my, I, I have no problem with this legally admitting the amount of people that are climbing over the fences or climbing through the border to get into, into our country every year. I have no problem increasing that amount. I think it's more complex thing than the show, but... You know, the, the problem we've done is we have actually incentivized cartels now because you're like, man, these people sure really have efficient ways to get from here to there and nowhere to go. Um, it's almost like we've created an economic incentive for other people to be able to do that. So uh, I, 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 I don't fault anybody who wants to come to this country. As, you know? as like, I don't a, know. A, a former border sector chief, Chris Clem on Politics, Politics, Politics out today uh, explained it's actually become a more profitable thing for the cartels than drug smuggling because they get all their money up front. Drug smuggling has a lot of different ways where it could fail, where either you're not getting the precursor, you're not moving it in, you're not getting the money back. Human trafficking. Now there's a business. All the money up front, put them through the wall, on to the next. Good to go. Nope. Anyway. Yeah. Uh, How so. does the modern border crisis look in the <laughs> Apple Vision Pro? <laughs> Uh, yeah. So I got one more story here. Uh, a worker at Nomura Plating, Plating Factory in Japan discovered a set of yellow paw prints leading away from a chemical tank. The cat was later spotted leaving the factory on security footage. So what's the problem? Well, the cat is covered, fell into a vat of toxic chemicals and is covered in uh, hexavalent chromium and is considered extremely, extremely toxic like, I mean, cat toxic literally went cat into a vat of acid yep i mean uh, now it's cat joker cat, cat normal, yeah i mean so, can, uh, can you imagine the cat lady who picked that one up i know <laughs> point interesting point it's the same chemical that leaked into the groundwater in the julie robert movie uh aaron brockovich which may actually not have been a factor in the community and that movie <laughs> may be full of it but it's neither here nor there uh but in any event um there you go. Uh, toxic cat roaming Japan. Is it, is it weird that, like, I really don't want my daughter to get cats because of toxoplasmia? Like, like I, 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 as a legitimate concern, I'm like, please don't be crazy. Um, I guess it's the number of cats. Cats can be an addiction for people, which I do think that does play a factor in. You know, Justin, I had a friend who was a teacher who probably had a very big cat addiction. Yeah, and you could not enter their house because the scent of cats was they they didn't notice it. And like I remember once they were getting upset because their daughter's boyfriend refused to go into the house. It's like they won't even come in the house and sit at the dinner table. It's like, yeah, it's unbearable in here, dude. It yeah, is completely unbearable in here. And you Stank. have no idea. Stank. Uh, it, well, and that's the thing about smells is you you become habituated to them, and you don't even know that you got a problem. Yeah, I mean that's yeah. you know that, like we have that with with the birds, but they have their own room, so it definitely like at the very least we have some kind of sensory a uh, 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 change from the non bird rooms and the bird room. So you'll walk in, you're like, oh, it smells like bird in here. Uh, but I, I can only imagine with with moving pets that are just putting their stank on everything. It's 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 gotta you you just eventually have to get desensitized to it. Let the record show that the moment I brought this up, Justin immediately announced that his birds are only stinky in their room. Well, they they are confined to one room. Yeah. Unlike other pets that roam. Yeah. Right. Cats roam. Dogs roam. Chinchillas. They get everywhere. Uh, uh, snakes the, the b-52 you see roam. that one you see that one when that the bangles or is that the b-52s rome b-52s rome rome if you yeah. Rome, yeah. want to yeah no i got there a little bit ahead of you uh <laughs> wait i mean you said it yeah yeah anybody got any picks <laughs> <laughs> we're not going to talk at all about the fact that there's a toxic cat ro roaming through japan apparently not Apparently not. We're just going to no, blast no, no, right well, by I it. A toxic cat <laughs> running through Japan. So, We're not going to go on any scenarios. We're not going <laughs> to embark on who might pick it up. No, no. It's right to whether or not my birds smell. 
<laughs> no, I'm not going to. We both know they smell. But the uh, 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 the reason I, I, I'm just looking at the clock. All right. <laughs> so there's no updates on the toxic cat. All uh, right. Last story is from a week ago. Apparently, it's now mutating. We'll come back in a big superior form. And yes. we can look forward to this in Godzilla, King Kong, Toxic Cat. Toxic Cat. Well, look, they got to expand the franchise. They've already, they, they already have them teaming up and fighting another monster. Is, in is, one, so. is, is, is there any kaiju movie that's a big dog? Has anyone done a big old dog movie? Yeah, like we got the big turtle with uh, 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 Gamera. We got, we got a big... You know, ape with King Kong. We got a big lizard. With would it uh, just be well, too silly, or would we would we love it too much that we'd have complicated feelings when it destroys a city? Maybe, maybe the closest thing is like Oakja, Clifford. So there is there is in the and I remember I trying to remember, look at it in uh, Skull Island, which is the animated series that takes place on Skull Island in the MonsterVerse. There is Dog, which is a giant canine kaiju. Hmm. What breed of dog? I mean, ho- uh, home by five on the name, but... <laughs> <laughs> um, big, giant, friendly dog. Uh, and then, apparently, um, there's an entire page of canine kaiju that we can look up. Ah, I, uh, my favorite is <laughs> Yamat Taransi. Uh, <laughs> um <laughs> This is from the Return of Ultraman. Oh my <laughs> god! In this thing too, uh, man. Uh, the regular kaiju maker may have been off that day. Uh, mm. I want to show you this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm not seeing a ton of really good giant kaiju dogs. Oh well, take a look at this, Brian. I just sent you a link. You're oh dear, you're shutting your mouth. Now. Okay, all right. Yeah, yeah you better shut your I mouth. I better shut my mouth. Shut your mouth. My mouth is closed. Yep. And shut your mouth. close it. But good. It's also Clifford, the big red dog. Let's not forget Clifford. Of course, Clifford. Yeah, no, I said Clifford. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. He's a big. He's a big red dog, man. That's why it's you like should never love poster. a dog. It's all over the place. Love makes little things grow. What? Yeah, it's not. It's not coming in. Hold on. Let me see. I've been getting. Um, uh, let me try for my other. Um. I mean, Marmaduke was already big. Like he was just a big dog. But that's not, that's like a regular big. That's like a big dog you see walking through your neighborhood, and you're like, "Damn, no, that's a big yeah, dog." That, not like a problematic beast that is exactly. Over that all of a sudden the takes police, a dump. yeah, the police would come in, the local police, and try, then try it again, Brian. See okay. If it went right. uh, the uh, 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 old. Uh, you know what's funny is I just refreshed and it said the New York Times breaking news. <laughs> For a second, I thought that there was a giant. It's dog. a big old dog. <laughs> All right, here we go. Uh, okay, what is this? <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> what? <laughs> what in the hot ham water is happening here? So this is a gigantic druid-looking creature, but the uh, 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 the face area is burlap, and it looks like it has lipstick on. It's got sharp teeth and antennae. I mean, it, it actually looks. What the like, hell is this? It looks like crossplay Chewbacca. Is yeah. what it looks like. Yeah. Oh my god! When you see a tiny city behind it, it gets better. <laughs> yep. Uh, but yeah, so we have dog from uh, Skull Island, and then we have whatever this whatever is. this is. But it's huge. It is stomping yeah. through the Japanese countryside. Sad yep. all the way. Thinking yeah. about its ex girlfriend. Oh, that bitch. Appropriate use of long way to go, but I got it. (laughs) There's another one on that same site called Wolf Wolf Gas. I saw something on uh, Twitter today that uh, a woman was complaining that she was at work and somebody called her a bitch, and her response was, uh, "Was it not a bitch that nurse Romulus?" (laughs) 
<laughs> oh, oh, next level response. <laughs> next level response. Because he probably didn't get the gag. <laughs> Also, it sounds like something that that Roy would say on Succession. <laughs> uh, anybody got any picks? I don't understand. I don't understand. I don't want to be around here anymore. Uh, I do. I I I think it was within the last week that I um I tricked our friend Ryer into watching The Good Place, and <clears throat> that show holds up. It's quite good. The good place. That's my pick. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, man. Good, uh, uh, fun show. Great cast. Great cast. Uh, I watched, oh, geez, what is the name of it? Something, something, Henry Sugar, the new Wes Anderson short film that won the Oscar uh, a couple weeks ago. It is on Netflix, and uh, I enjoyed it. Quite a bit. Now, I'm a huge Wes Anderson fan, but uh, it stars Benedict Cumberbatch and Ben Kingsley, and uh, it's it's really fun. Really good. The Wonderful Story of Henry Sugar, based on a Roald Dahl uh, short story. Very cool. I saw Dune 2. Hey! Oh! What did you think of Dune Part 2? Oh! Uh, uh, I loved it. I absolutely loved it. Um, you know, at the, I've said this before, at the end of part one, you know, when I didn't realize I was walking into only half the book, you know, towards in sitting in the theater, I'm like, wait, there's a lot to wrap up in the next 20 minutes. Or are they going to do this? Oh, they don't. Uh, I'm like, well, I really enjoyed this. I will judge this once I get to see the other half and kind of think about how I feel about it as a whole. And, uh, did you, thoroughly, uh, thoroughly, did, thoroughly did, did you get tricked into not realizing there was a third half that was coming? <laughs> well, that's the other book, though. That's not that's that's Dune Massage. Yeah, I, I I did not know that they were going for a three part franchise. I've my Dune experience has always ended at the end of the original book, uh, and and yeah, so, which is where this ended. You know, they 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 put some stuff in there. You know, they took out like his you know his sister wasn't born here which she would have been and whatnot, but you got, you got the Dune story of like, Hey, uh, I've taken this path. Billions will die. And you're left to decide, was it ego or was he really trying to serve, solve, you know, serve a greater good? And that's so, what I love uh, about Dune. Uh, cer certainly the second half seems to end with the implication that he's done a noble thing. Um, but uh, from not what, if you ask my wife. <laughs> uh, from what I've heard, uh, uh, it may turn out to be otherwise. Well, I think that that's, well, I don't, but... that's that's there in the movie, in my opinion. Especially if you look at the uh, you know Zendaya's character is is really the one with the arc in 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 the movie, and and the fact that we end where we end with all the characters feeling the way that they're feeling. Uh, uh, I do think that there's there. There, I left with a a feeling of unease about all the decisions that were that were made by our uh, our our main characters. Yeah, when I watch like reviews of it, number of reviews say that yeah, he's the bad guy. He's he's done his villain arc because he chose this path that leads to sixty. They point out sixty one billion people dying, and you know, like my wife watching him say, "Yeah, I'm going to marry you, Princess Ariel," in, and she's like, "Well, I hate him." I'm like, "Well." What you don't get is, you know, that's the only way to try to keep the ending together. And like, spoiler alert, you know, they never consummate the marriage. Um, and because he does love Chani, he does, he is dedicated. To her. But I liked it. It was, I thought that they handled the complexity really well because you're, you're given this. Were they manipulated by prophecy, or are the people who were trying to create the prophecy actually following through as agents of the prophecy? And the, the spoiler alert, sort of the grand theme of Dune is that. You know, that takes place 10,000 years after the machines, but guess what? The machines didn't completely go away, and humanity is going to be facing an extinction level event, and humanity is not ready for it. And the purpose of Quetzal Haderach is to basically make sure that humanity survives. And much like my strategy and my platform for being governor <laughs> means you have to take very, very, sometimes it's such extreme positions on things that you are the villain of the story for thousands of years, 
until the grander scheme comes true, which is which is what I love about Dune is like it's like what I love about Watchmen of Adrian Vate is Adrian Vate's like, well, if this is true, this is also true. I've got to do this horrible thing. I I didn't know that. Uh, um, uh, I I know in the Dune mythology they focus on uh, the Butlerian Jihad, which is basically you know man shall never create a thinking machine. I always thought that was lore to uh, create the the class of the Mentats and 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 basically explain away other stuff. But it sounds like you're hinting that. Maybe they didn't go entirely away. The what? The thinking <laughs> machine. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm not, like, yeah, that is the point. Is that they, they, they did not all go. And when you get into later books, in, in we, the, there's things that happen that like, there's a thing called the scattering, which is basically after periods of the Civil War enacted by this, and then I don't want to get into spoilers, but the story gets weird in a way that I love people go further out to reaches beyond and sort of humanity loses contact and other parts of humanity come racing back into known space running from something. And, and that's this like, what are you running from? And it's like, Oh, we're going to fight you for resources. Cause uh, it's uh, pretty bad out there. I, I, I did like in this iteration of Dune, the way they handled the kind of, uh, for lack of a better word, psychic communication, you know, mm -hmm. uh, where it's like, oh, no, 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 this this child in my belly is talking to me. And and uh, like they, they didn't do the David Lynch, like, could he be the one? All of that stuff. Um, uh, it, it felt very natural, organic, easy to slide into. Yeah, I think that I, I love the David Lynch thing, considering what he had to work with. It's a miracle that movie got made and was actually enjoyable and watchable. Uh, I think that he he did an amazing thing. You look at the production value on that and the quality. Like, there's so much amazing stuff in there, but it was just hard to try to condense all that into the time that they did. And I think here, um, you know, we talked about this before. Sometimes you watch versions, people make a version of a thing, and you're like, it's one thing to say, okay, that's different than why I like it, but you go like, this is not what it's about, and I, you get things where people like when David Fincher made Fight Club, you know, Chuck Palyunk's like, yeah, that's better than the book. Cause he's like, Fincher got everything Palyunk was trying to do and then used film to even accentuate that and magnify that and do it in even, in an even sort of deeper sort of level. When we watch, I don't know, some new Star Wars films or projects and stuff, you're like, yeah, like literally they just scattered a bunch of toys on a table and played with it and said, let's do this. And it's like, oh, well, what if okay. the Jedi had five lightsabers? <laughs> it was a robot or, just swinging like said, a rage. I'm going to force you, but yeah. I'm going to say, no, no, no. I force your force. <laughs> and, and Villain knew, if you think about this, like, you know, you it, it's Dune on the surface appears to be kind of like the white savior myth. You know, and you have to dig in to go into like, yeah. well, it's actually saying maybe it's not a good idea. <laughs> like, 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 you know, the idea that there's it's and I like that he amplified that because that was Herbert was trying to go for him as like, be careful of heroes, be careful who you are. And and I thought Villeneuve really picked up on that because you, you can walk away with a lot of just a lot of complexity there. The going between Chani's outright skepticism of him and Stilgar, like find somebody that looks at you the way Stilgar looks at Madia. Yeah, you know, like just find that in life. You well, know? and that, and that's and that's why centering the movie around her and and having Did you her see be he dropped that Snickers bar. <laughs> he is the chosen one. Uh, 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 having her, her acceptance of him and then ultimate uh, uh, betrayal by the end is is kind of the story. That's that's what you, I think, uh, uh, and I, I thought Zendaya was uh, was was great. I thought all the all the acting was was uh, was really Austin really good. Austin Butler, I, yeah. What a we're we're going to. I think I look at other projects that come out from big budget projects, and particularly like Disney and stuff. And you look at that, and you just like, man, I really like it when they just a director's able to get really great talent, and we get great people in there who just not just cosplay the roles, but play the roles. Like, yeah. you know, Austin Butler's fade is bad guy. Like I'm like, <laughs> it was great. He was great. Yeah. You know? And I, I didn't start off as like, I didn't really know who he was. I watched Elvis. I go, Oh, this guy's pretty good. Elvis. And then watch this. And I'm like, yep, this guy, everybody's just great in it. Uh, I learned during this movie that anytime somebody shaves their eyebrows, I think they're Jared Leto. 
Uh, <laughs> but that guy was pretty good, too. Oh, my God. Jared Leto had to be watching that movie. Just go, what? I'm right here. I'm right here. No, that's like he's like he's just watching his replacement roll right. in. he's like, like, oh, no, I'm screwed. (laughs) Other people can shave their eyebrows. Nobody. (laughs) James, why didn't you tell me? Casting. They're like, hey, what about Jared? And so he's like, oh. Are we ready for him to be in character with a guy that has cannibal girlfriends and stuff? Like, do yeah. you really put Jared Leto on set in character for this role? Yeah, about that. Mm. That said, I want to see a Wallace movie from the Blade Runner franchise. I think it'd be great for that. Gentlemen, it's been weird. Yeah, it has. And we're out. Except we're we're still Fuck. live. We're still live. Oh, what? Yeah. So if now you wanted to say anything that you deeply regret, now is a good time. Of course. I'm gonna go peep. Hmm. Br moment before. Okay. Uh, hi everybody. It's me, Justin Robert Young. Uh, finally, we've cleared the decks, and it's just me and you. Many people believe that Weird Things is a program, and I'm here to tell them no. Uh, other people think that Weird Things is a podcast, and I'm here to tell them no. Listen here, Jack. We can do both. If you don't think that Weird Things is a podcast that you can listen to, and you can enjoy on an intellectual level. Well, I got news for you. Don't bet against weird things. I'm taking all of your questions now in the chat, and I'll answer all of your questions. I know there's been a lot of speculation about the questions. Well, I just want to let you know, speculate no more. We have it ready to go. Just any question that comes in, I'll answer it. Doug in the chat writes, uh, hey, what's what's up with Weird Things? Well, Doug, thank you for being here. Uh, weird Things is a great uh, program starring Andrew Main and Brian Brushwood and Justin Robert Young, where we discuss news of the weird and various different elements of the scientific frontier. Uh, about five or six years into the show, we found that there was a lot more science to talk about than weird stuff, and we also realized that a lot of weird stuff had dark undertones to it. So we just uh, uh, started talking more about science. Gambling Man writes, many people believe weird things is just Justin R. Young's presidency podcast promotion campaign. Is this true? Uh, We can't say for legal reasons whether or not this is all sponsored content to to promote me uh, becoming the president of the United States, but we're also legally barred from denying it. So uh, you come to your own conclusion. And that brings us to an end of my TED Talk. Please rank us five stars in... uh, the Ted, 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 the the Ted app. In the Ted app, I my favorite comment I saw was somebody showed you know the the image of Harkonnen, Baron Harkonnen's head coming out of like the the gold black liquid, and they said this is the final stage Huberman. That you're an Andrew Huberman fan. It's like hilarious because you're like okay, because it's like you know, man, wrong crowd. Okay. This, this would have really played better on a different show. I'm gonna go call it. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, so let, let's Someone's start. Dying, let's start though. this Someone's show. Someone's dying laughing. <laughs> All right. You ready? Three. Hold on. I'm gonna put you on front. There you go. Three, two. Hello and welcome to the After Things podcast. I'm Andrew Mean, joined by Justin Robert Young. Well, hello. And Mr. Brian Brushwood. So, gentlemen, I have a topic I want to talk about. I have kind of a a funny, kind of relevant anecdote about this is that um, one of the things that I've done throughout kind of my journey, whether it was in magic or anything else like this, is I've spent a lot of times explaining things to other people because I realize that helps me understand it. Not a novel Andrew Main discovery. Yes, I know this. Uh, but, but I've put that into practice and I found that like, you know, magic, writing about magic, describing how something works, forces you to break it down and understand it. When I became a writer, writing about writing and trying to explain the process forced me to understand this, you know, understand it deeper, et cetera. When I wanted to get into technology, 
um, you know, reason one of the reasons I got hired at OpenAI was that I would do a thing and somebody would say, can you explain this to other people? And I would write a thing and end up on the OpenAI website explaining how a thing worked. And that was a way for me to sort of learn and create opportunity for myself. And that's a thing that I've continued to do. Uh, when I left OpenAI several months ago, I decided, and I haven't been able to do as much as I like to keep writing about AI technologies. And uh, the funny thing is, is that one, it really, I, I really encourage this for anybody. If, if you think about this, like, well, who would I explain it to? Like, maybe explain ChatGPT to your grandmother. You write a thing to explain it to her, you know, explain it to yourself. You can think about explaining to other people. Since I've been doing this though, it's funny. Uh, and publishing these stuff as blog posts and stuff, I get job offers from big tech companies because they say, oh, we see you explain this thing really well. Would you consider working here? And, and I think that's the thing to think about. One of the reasons that like doing the work of just explaining something that's, you know, maybe not the most sophisticated thing. I mean, some of the stuff is sophisticated, but the point is, has a lot of benefits. That's a good prompt. Um, <clears throat> uh, I have noticed that when you have a skill set and you know things, the only way to mess things up is to not have action or motion happen around them. To like, you can have knowledge and know things and sit alone in your room uh, and nobody will ever know that you know these things. You will never encounter by random discourse uh, opportunities to, you know, use these things. Uh, and so as re a result, and keep in mind, all of humanity is kind of getting out of their introverted, we all took a day off and watched Netflix for a couple of years, uh, that, that constant interaction with other people creates just so many organic opportunities to uh, like, like, oh yeah, no, uh, you're doing that dumb because of this. What, what do you know about this? Oh, I, I don't know all these things. And it's like, would you like a job? And you're like, no, but I like your style. It's, 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 it's strange. Yeah, it, it shows a lot of it as these things are fast moving, can be complex. And when you break, take something and break it down to explain it to other people, one, it shows a degree of mastery. And I don't feel like I feel like I have that, but I know enough to get a response out of a thing. And I just can't, I, I think as a practice for other people is to think about like, yeah, like, you know, write an email to family members explaining how something works. Just I'm get in the habit of doing that. Uh, uh, the way I would think of it is, and forgive me if this is an oversimplification, like if you know you're 1% smarter than everyone else on a particular topic, then go to the casino because casinos run on action. Just get a lot of interactions with other people and you will find the right one that, that is a fit at for the whatever casino? it is you want to do. Why are they at the casino? Well, uh, 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 do we want to do a comedy bit or talk about? <laughs> I, I'm just trying to make clear why, like, why would you gamble? Uh, casino, casinos only have a one percent advantage, but if they have enough action, action being humans coming and going. Oh, this is a metaphor. God, yes. Okay. All right. Okay. Just wanted to make sure that that was what we were talking about. Just because I was not clear. I'll be over here. I just didn't know. <laughs> the chips are metaphors. <laughs> the metaphorical I, I... Rou roulette wheel. <laughs> Audio listeners. Oh, this one's Brian. double metaphor. Uh, this is our, our ongoing conversation about <laughs> metaphors. <laughs> Yep. Let me go to the uh, metaphorical parking lot. Do you have a metaphorical uh, uh, loyalty card? No, thank you. <laughs> because I'm not loyal to the. I'm metaphors. not loyal to this metaphor. It's going to be an airport metaphor tomorrow. I'm just letting you know. <laughs> my my point is my point is is when you have something of value, apply it. Uh, uh, give it as many opportunities as possible. Do it, yeah. To, Repetition. To yes, exactly. Because I do think it, it, it demystifies the idea that there is such a gulf between idea and action, and uh, it's it's something that in yeah, like I I really cannot stress to people enough. 
get to the end of projects. <laughs> get to the end of the projects that you care about the most in the world because you're going to learn more from any way that that ends, literally any way that that ends, than trying to obsess about figuring out the perfect beginning to an idea or the perfect way that something is going to happen. I, just I, I, just I, run to the end. A concrete example, uh, when I had fruit thrown on my stage in West Virginia, I learned that uh, that audience... Never go to West Virginia again. <laughs> uh, that audience expected a traditional magician, and I failed to prime them for a alternative experience. And uh, on that humiliating six-hour drive back where not even the radio worked... Uh, I, I thought through what a, uh, 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 that's when I first came up with like, okay, I'm going to buy a digital projector. I'm going to have a slideshow that tells the story of Brian that makes use of the 20 to 30 minutes of dead bandwidth as everybody's filed in and prime them for the experience of a countercultural anti magic show, magic show, uh, 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 only the pain of having gone through that would have created that for me. It's a fair point. I, mm -hmm. I had my, my own, what is, you know, understanding that not all audiences are the same, which, you know, is something any performer should understand by the time they're 11, but I did <laughs> not. Um, I had a, I had a magic routine that was like a bit, you know, very humor based, you know, and I, I did a bit that was like, I would go on about, you know, being the, and this was a bit I learned at a lecture from somebody, it was his, but it was great, had permission. You do a bit about like how you spent several years learning the art of coin magic and, you know, spending hours and hours every day for, to finally be able to do this. I, I, you excited. were able to pitch this at the age of 11? Uh... No, no, I was 20, 20 when I was oh, doing okay. this. Okay, all, right, all right, all right. No, I didn't, I was saying I should have, thing I didn't understand at 20, I should have known when I was much younger. No, no, no. I, I, I mean, I could do joke magic when I was 11, but like a thing I didn't, because like this bit, I would have loved this bit when I was a kid, but I wouldn't have understand wrong audience. So I'm doing this bit and I'm at a company picnic in Miami or a family picnic or whatever, or a company like, you know, blue collar company picnic in Miami. And so I'm out in like this, you know, park, you know, in this, uh, you know, enclosure. And I'm doing this bit like I've been practicing several years learning how to do this thing. And I'm very excited to perform this for you now. And my hand kind of casually drops to my side. And all of a sudden you hear clink. Clink, 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 because all these coins fall out of my sleeve, followed by a giant coin. And this is the bit. You then go clink. And the idea is that I just, you know, I'm being so pompous and then the coins fall on the ground. And just like, and let me tell you what, what I would do that in South Beach at like, you know, Miami Beach and night, you know, clubs, black, killed, killed, killed. Okay. Blank silence. I'm like, all right, go on. And then afterwards, they complained to the booker. Yeah, this guy was so bad. Coins were falling out of his sleeve. <laughs> <laughs> like, like, that, was, that, was, that was the bit. Yeah. That was the bit. And I was like, I even had to comedically time the last coin to fall down because it was this, it gave this real clink, clink, clink. Oh, then blank. And I'm like, oh, wrong audience, dude. Wrong audience. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I did have at one point a show where uh, clearly whoever was writing for the school newspaper wanted some other uh, speaker or entertainer to show up. But like with hate, she wrote, Brian Brushwood was so bad, he managed to cut off his own tongue and just act like it was no big deal. <laughs> 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 future wall street excuse me watching the poster. yeah man these are really great examples i've never failed <laughs> oh sorry that's i shouldn't have laughed you, that's why you're our friend because yeah. we want to be around it's just never yeah that's great for you guys that's <laughs> a, a great lesson what comes back to the thing you know my point I made before is it, 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 it's Failure stories are great if there's, and then I learned this lesson and then I improved on it. <laughs> Not, yeah, I've got a great yeah. failure story. What did you learn? I screwed this one up too. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think there's, there's, there's a few things. Number one, in terms of the operation, if you have a plan and then you execute it, uh, it, it tells you a lot about what the plan was. Nine times out of 10, at least in my experiences where I did horrifyingly fail, uh, it was very, very good at 
showing me how off my conception of the problem was and that it wasn't necessarily any operational element of like, oh, my plan wasn't necessarily bad. I just didn't really know the problem. Uh, uh, and and now that I got to the end of it, now I have a better idea to replicate it going forward. And then the other side of it is just emotional toughening, right? Like just just knowing that if you get you know that, knocked in that, the dirt, you can get back up and uh, 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 rock and roll the next day. That thick skin, T H I C C. Yep. Yep. Yeah. There is also something for and and I, it's tangentially related, I guess, is that. If the difference between my friends in high school who I thought were super talented and the ones who succeeded and the ones who didn't is the ones that succeeded threw themselves into environments where they were going to be challenged by other really talented people. Like part of the advantage, like I'm not a big higher education fan in many you know, senses, but part of the advantage of college, if you're particularly somebody who's pursuing something like a, you know, a, a more, you know, sophisticated pursuit, you know, if you wanted to be a mathematician or physicist or a computer science program or whatever, uh, there's, if you've never been, if maybe you, if you've been exposed to other really highly talented people, it's great. But if you haven't, college is a really good humbling experience to all of a sudden realize, oh yeah, being to do, to get to where you want to be, you can't just be the smartest person in your school. Yeah. You've got to be the smartest person one of the smartest people in your state, or you got to be at that sort of level and, and, or push yourself there. And so, <laughs> My friends who succeeded really well were the ones that their peers were very talented in their own ways and pushed them and just made them want to sort of strive. My friends who did not succeed retreated to places where they could just feel superior. Yeah. Uh, I, I'll never forget feeling clever for having learned how to play Martha, my dear from the Beatles white album. Uh, and I, I, you know, played it for, a, you know, my newfound friend at college and he was like, well, that's cool. Let me show you this. And then he actually played real music. <laughs> <laughs> it, it is very humbling to realize that what is amazing to you is not amazing to everyone else. Well, just also realizing how like, where, where, where the standard is. You know, like understanding that, like, hey, here's how fast people run. Here's how smart people are. Uh, and, and if you want to be in the world, then... You know the 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 lesson is figuring out where you slot in, uh, inter and then from there where your natural talents are, and and where you can build around those to uh, uh, really excel. I had a friend that was very bright, really, really exceptionally bright, extremely knowledgeable in high school, like just understand philosophy and just other things at just a level that like I don't think any of my other friends really did, uh, but had sort of this could be confident on the service, but sort of an insecurity issue and lived in South Florida and moved back home to some, you know, rural part of the country. And then, you know, found his way into taking a community college classes or whatever. And then there would get all this praise from his teachers at how smart he was. Yeah. And, you know, and his thinking is it like, yeah, Hey, he is a genius. And it's like, and I, I and I was trying to kind of certainly say it. I'm like, you're in the wrong school. Yeah, you're, you're, you're no, no disrespect to community college class. Like I took night school community college classes. They're great, but they're they're not getting a lot of people walking in there who've spent a lot of time previously studying these subjects or just deeply interested in these subjects. These are people who are at real jobs, you know, families, things like that to sort of do. And so, yeah, of course, you're going to stand out and the teachers are like you, but don't take that as, as an assumption that, yes, you are now you're, you are now Newton. You know, you're now this like, no, it means that you've got to an ability there that you got to keep moving forward. And I just watched this person stagnate because the moment I would like, Hey, maybe you should send your work there. And they, he'd get real criticism, shut him down. He just would not respond. Uh, it was, th it's a there, loss. there is a real phenomenon though, where it's like, everybody is the smartest person in their high school. And then they go to Harvard or one of the Ivy leagues. And all of a sudden they're nothing. And, and they, they just crater. Uh, and, uh, in those situations, uh, this must have been 20 years ago, uh, I had read that it's probably healthier to go to like a state school or something in those situations. Yeah, well, I, I was fortunate not to be the smartest person in my high school. So that <laughs> already a lot. top advantage already yeah. ahead of the Prepared curve. Me, you know, <laughs> uh, I was probably the biggest BSer and could convince myself I was, but I wasn't. 
Um, but yeah, I think that that is the problem where you're they do when you're not exposed to that. I think that's one of the advantages of programs like Math Olympiad and other things like intramural stuff and, and, and those things and sending kids off to science camps and stuff as they start to see. Well, wow, I've been uh, I mean, I was an advisor. Uh, I was on the board of directors for a program called Adventures of the Mind, where they would bring in, you know, hundreds of kids from around the country, high school students and put them on a college campus. And these were kids who weren't always necessarily straight A students. Maybe they're B plus students, but they were very social and willing to just engage and talk. And we'd bring in Nobel laureates and other people in there. And you would watch these kids talk to other outgoing kids. And it was just wonderful because you just realized the value of like, you know, made, you know, lifelong friendships, put them together, watch them work on projects. And you could see like, oh, let me take, you know, really bright kid from here, really, really bright kid from over there, put them there, put them in a room. They've never been in a room with this many other bright kids. And it's just amazing to watch. It's like, and it's like the equivalent would be sports. It's like, oh, let me get the best football player from every high school and, you know, put them onto a team or do this. And that is what happens when you start to get to elite levels. You are now around elites. And that's my advice to other people is that like, find places to be around that. And that can be one as a peer, other as if you're, if you wanted to be, let's say a writer, go to these writing conventions, you know, go in there because there's a place to say, Hey, I'm a newbie. and I'm going to go sit and listen to this really smart person lecture. And after a few years, you might be like, you know what? I know more about like how, you know, police procedures worked in the 19th century than anybody else. Now I'm going to go give a lecture on this. And the people that you went to go talk are going to come listen to you talk about this. And congratulations. You're now up there. It, it it is a cliche, but I think there really is wisdom in the idea of better like, cliche than metaphor, Brian. Better uh, cliche than metaphor. So. <laughs> there is a cliche that says that you are the sum total of uh, the five people closest to you, and that goes uh -huh. all the way from your uh, financial status to your intellect to the physical shape of your body and so on. Uh, but 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 I'll be danged if that doesn't seem to be like surrender like have the courage to surround yourself with, uh, 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 for lack of a better phrase, a superior crowd. And that is, I believe that. I think there's some evidence that shows it up and is why I text Sam Altman a lot. Why, <laughs> yeah, he, 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 he's not as eager to text me. So, <laughs> you know. Still counts. He, like, yeah, Still counts. <laughs> he knows this too. Yeah, you definitely <laughs> you get know? to say, well, I was texting with Sam Altman the other day. I mean, and... look, look. <laughs> if, it, if, it, if, it, if it's a thumbs up reaction once a month, you text with Sam Altman. <laughs> exactly, exactly. He's exactly responding but yeah he's not sitting there thinking oh, i i gotta share this with andrew because you know because like his, his circle you know <laughs> big deal not, and only and not only be, getting bigger and it would not no would not be good for the world if i was in his five i'll put it that yeah. way and i understand that so uh uh, uh real quick uh, uh uh open ai uh a related question there was a uh, a report that came out this week that apple was looking to work with Google for uh, uh, AI stuff, and that they had also had conversations uh, with OpenAI. Uh, 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 just in general, uh, what are what are your thoughts on Apple pairing with anybody to do that kind of information service stuff? I have no inside knowledge, so I may make that clear. I have no, I have no, no inside knowledge of anything about that. So anything I'm going to say is going to be pure, pure speculation on my own behalf. Um, Apple is very good at coming in late to market. Apple has historically been very good at looking at the scene. You know, there, there were tablets in the early aughts, let me the late nineties. Then Apple realized, no, to have a really effective tablet, you need to have the thing last all day. You need to have screen, do this battery, do this, whatever. Same with the iPhone. You could not have made an iPhone, a phone that was as functional as the iPhone two years earlier, maybe not even 18 months early. It just was not, the screens didn't exist. The processors didn't exist. Those things did not exist. Um, and so they kind of come in late into the market, but actually when the technology reaches the right point, that's been the way they've done. Uh, and they've also, you know, tried to go into things. We, we know that they finally shut down their car initiative, which I think was just a dumb idea from the get go, because it's just, you need apples incapable of making the kind of decisions that you need to make at that level to do it. And it's also a very low margin business, but Apple really was caught off guard by chat GPT. Very, very caught off guard by chat GPT. So was everybody else. Google at least had the advantage of already having DeepMind, having Google Brain, having an incredible bench of talent and resources and huge amounts of compute to be able to build and train models and to take to scale up the efforts they did. 
Remember the transformer, which you know launched all this, was invented at Google, and, and yeah. Google's consistently outputted a lot of great research. And that was, you know, finally Gemini Ultra is a good model. You know, it's a GPT-4 class. It took them a year to get there from the launch of GPT-4, but Google got there. Apple did not have anything like those kinds of resources to start going. And they watched ChatGPT come out like, oh, this is kind of cool. And then, you know, you hear like, yeah, Siri sucks. Just use ChatGPT. And, you know, Brian and I both do the thing where we have the hot button. On me our too, iPhone just guys. Me too. Yeah. <laughs> I do it too. The three of us, we have a dedicated ChatGPT button on our phone now. What, what a button. little brother <laughs> moment. Jesus. <laughs> Sorry. Dude. So, you know, Brian and I did this and Justin followed along. Oh, hell. Yeah. So... Apple knows this. Apple understands. They look at this. Like, I think ChatGP still is still like in the top 10 apps, you know, in the app store. They're looking at usage. They're knowing this. They're knowing that people are not wanting to go to Siri to do things. And part of what the Apple premise was, let's have a unifying ecosystem that can handle all this stuff. When you don't go to their point of entry for that and you use another system to solve a problem, that runs a risk. Apple faces... I think Apple's going to have a healthy business forever. I've talked before about the Apple Vision Pro. It makes me very concerned about the, the way the, the hardware was a compromise. And individually, each component was great. The way it was all put together was a disaster. The way they launched it without the right kind of support, Keystone apps, et cetera, made me very, very worried about Apple. And Apple now in their ML pursuits, they've been quietly hiring, buying up like a lot of like smaller, you know, AI companies, but I think it's more just for the talent to sort of build out their bench of, of talented people. Um, they're going to, they know they need to start training their own models. They also want to be able to, they know that maybe you want to run some things on device. And I think that they're going to be trying to build in an on device. I mean, a thing that just runs on your phone and doesn't send things elsewhere because Apple's very much about security. And, yeah. and, and I think that that's an opportunity for them. So why do I think about them trying talking to Google and app? I think they're trying to find a solution for the short term because yeah. they know it's going to take a while to build the thing they want. I think that they're looking at, we want to deal for the next three years, you know, you're going to power this AI for us, but they're going to want probably have models on premises at Apple, not go to OpenAI or go to Google or whatever. They're going to have a lot of demands they're going to want to go that they'll be willing to pay. And like their plan is eventually to wean them off, off of them. Google will make that deal. Like Google would make that deal in a heartbeat. I have no doubt they would make that deal, but Apple would be wary of Google. I don't think that's their first choice of partners. Well, that's the the big the big question would be, okay, well, where does Apple want to make that deal, and which way does that deal go? Because right now, when it comes to to Google, Google pays quite a bit to be the exclusive uh, uh, or or that that first place search uh, uh, position for Safari. Uh, uh, I, the, the, the two things that, that I thought of, uh, uh, with this story was number one, Apple's usually really cool waiting out. Like they'll wait until they have their thing. Uh, they understand that this technology is not something that they can wait another generation on. They, they no. want, they need to roll out a, some kind of LLM solution on iOS that is built in or native or feels good to it. Uh, immediately they they need to figure that out asap and so that's where uh, uh i think it does not surprise me that they were having these kinds of conversations but i do wonder it's like you know for if you're if you're apple i wonder how they're looking at this is this a we pay you or is this a oh, yeah. a, a you pay us no can they have to pay them because one is the only advantage for Remember, Google is default search because Apple knows that Google is able to make more money out of search revenue than Apple can, right? Apple makes billions of dollars per year. The amount of money they make per year from Google being default search in Safari is incredible. It's I think, yeah, but yeah we looked even, it up. It was like $8 billion a year or something like that. It's like, it's, it's and, insane. And there have been points where Google has actively violated the privacy of users on Safari and circumvented things that Apple put in place that any other vendor would have found themselves blocked but not Google because it makes, you know, it's pure $8 billion of profit for Apple yeah. a year. And they love that. So as far as inference, remember, inference is expensive. You know, there's a reason why you're rate limited when you use any of these things, you know, whether it's Claude, whether it's, you know, uh, ChatGPT or Gemini, is that there is a limit to how many queries and questions because these things are expensive. They're computationally very expensive. 
Now, Google could probably offer them a thing like, yeah, let us handle this. But then the deal is going to be they're going to train on customer data or do yeah. something that Apple absolutely would not want. So Apple would right now is going to be negotiated in my, you know, I, I can't see where they would, you know, there is no incentive. This is, this is not search. This is not something where they would be making money on it. They would want to pay for for the information yeah, services. Absolutely. Because it's because remember, it, it basically all Google does is basically just add the Google, the way Google makes money, Google search into your iPhone. Yeah. You know, and, and Apple's like, well, if you want that in our iPhone, then we get a percentage. There is no revenue by offering a free service to, you know, Apple, unless you get data the other way, which Apple would never want to do. Yeah. And in, in its current incarnation. So this would be, Apple would be paying for servers and whatever. And I think that, I think that what they would do is, Apple hosts a lot of data outside of Apple's actual systems, you know, they, but they're, they're actual their own infrastructure. Like they've done cloud services, other things like this to sort of match capacity, but they use, you know, their end to end security, things like this. It's hard to LM stuff. They would just make a deal where they would basically like either one is to let us license a model from you, make it our own version. We'll host it on your servers, but we're the ones that have the keys you know, or we, some dedicated capacity thing, whatever, that would be the thing I think they'll do is they license a model from somebody that didn't do their own version of it. Well, basically we'll see. make Siri smart, make Siri smart, please. Oh my God. It's so, <laughs> and, and you know, Alexa's the same boat. Like, these yep. things yeah. Are just, and it's Stinky. part of it's like, yeah, you, it, if you want to know why, why they're bad, it's because they've been following the same path for almost 20 years and the researchers behind it were very knowledgeable about how to do natural language requests in a certain way but that way could not scale like deep learning could and even when deep learning showed signs of life they were very adamant about following through their course and i i think to me like gpt2 which was the you know the, the big wave making model that first you know open eyes like ah oh, it might be too dangerous to release uh that thing's five years old and you could have improved and you can I, you can run that on device. You could run that on device. The fact that I've actually, you can run a version on device that Apple engineers basically optimized for the iPhone, but Apple never put this thing on device. You could have trained a highly efficient GPT-2 powering Siri that could have done a lot of great stuff. And we would be going, oh, wow, Siri's great, but they never did. Yeah. Oh. I mean, it's amazing how fast all that stuff looked really stupid i think siri went from like frustrating to stupid alexa went from frustrating from, to from adorable to stupid yeah like, like she, well she told quick, jokes quick well we we talk about and i used an example for like hard <laughs> when we're asking about what's going to happen with the future of search and stuff and i brought up the example is we, we're conditioned to think about it in a certain way all siri and alexa really are is audio remote controls. That yes. is all they are. They're just a remote control. You use your voice. That is literally what, the way we use them. And that's because that's which, the limit uh, of how we which, which is agonizing because when I use a remote control and I click the Netflix button, I don't expect Amazon to come up and say, showing you an Amazon summary of this Netflix yeah. show. Would, would you, would, 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 would you <laughs> like to buy a t-shirt that says Netflix? <laughs> right. <laughs> Uh, uh, based on your yeah. order history, you would really like a new T-shirt that says Netflix. <laughs> no, I wouldn't. Shut up. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I have to think about, like, I I don't, I'm trying to think, like, but when do I use my Alexa or my series? Like, maybe. I, I, I will say Alexa we use often essentially to interact with lights. We will turn lights you know, on and off. Remote control. Yeah, with, with the Alexa and Siri will be core Apple functionality. So text messages and, and stuff like that, because I wear my AirPods so much, I will often be using Siri either in the car or on AirPods to text back and forth with people. I, I, I will use Siri in that kind of private situation where it's like, hey, remind me of the thing. Uh, set an alarm for nine o'clock, set an alarm for 901, set an alarm for 902, set an alarm for 903 and remind me that I'm supposed to get up in time for the bones. Uh, I, I, like that, that's serious. But, but that's, but that's to, to Andrew's point, we're, we're just talking about remote control stuff. Right. There's literally no element of uh, uh, you saying to Siri, Hey, the bones is at 10 o'clock tomorrow. Can you just make sure that I'm up and remind me when I'm actually up 
that which, which is where we yeah. want to go. And then, meanwhile, uh, uh, Alexa. And by the way, I'm 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 done with being courteous about using the name. I don't care if it stop activates. being polite. Yeah. Start getting real. <laughs> uh, well, with the order toilet paper, we don't care. <laughs> when Alexa, when, when I talk to Alexa, it's almost always like we're just in the kitchen and all the kids are around, and uh, usually we just want to hear some type of music. But I have to learn the stupid syntax of not actually asking for the song because oh, God. God forbid she would actually play the thing that I actually want. So I have to. Learn how to say, Alexa, please play Spotify, artist blank, album blank, track blank. I'll show you something that's going to make it things kind of like, uh, kind of insane. Have you heard about Grok, G-R-O-Q, not the... Uh, not not the Elon Musk one? Yeah, not that. So I'm going to share with you my screen. So Grok is basically some researchers have built a, a kind of a different sort of processing system to make things smarter. And uh, there I have di several different uh, models like Mixtral 7B is a tiny, it's a 7 billion parameter model. Uh, Set Llama 70B is much bigger. So we'll use that because I think that's a better test. Uh, and so I'll show you what's cool about this. Um, tell me about, about the weird things podcast. Okay, again, this is a pretty sizable model. Damn. Hot oh, damn. Very fast. That was okay. very fast. 1.5 yeah. seconds uh, and uh, correct. <laughs> yeah. Now, if I go to use the, uh, this is the new Google Gemma model, which is uh, 7B, which is very small. So let's try that. Wow. Brap. So that was these things, half as fast. <laughs> Or, or or twice uh, as fast. I don't, yeah, it's 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 insane how fast these things are. So let's go Mixtral, which is another seven B model. Let's try that again. Seven Bs. Yeah, you could almost fit on on device. So, point is, is uh, these things now they've come up with ways on the hardware way to improve the speed of this stuff. What that also means is that the lag when you have a conversation in voice. There's some people now doing demos of using this with voice conversations when you start talking to the model. And one of the things that's going to be happening is Start feeding the model your audio before it finishes, and it can start to understand where you're going. And then when you you finish, it'll respond immediately. We're going to see uh, this year that lag between speaking to the system and the response is going to go away. By the end of the year, you're going to be using really smart systems and talking to them at a conversational level. And it will be able to respond faster than a human but we won't because it'll freak you out. Well, and uh, uh, man, we are seeing like within this year, the elimination of the carefully constructed sentence to our robotic devices. We're just going to talk like we talk. It's it's not going to be Klaatu, Barata, Nick too, or else you get yeah. a, a totally wrong uh, uh, thing where it's like, I was just going to say, Siri does the same dumb thing with anything audio, uh, if I say, if I'm listening to a podcast, but I want to play the new Future and Metro uh, Boomin uh, album, if I say, play the new Future album, uh, it'll start playing whatever new Future album would be found in a podcast because I'm currently in the podcast app. And it won't ask me, hey, are you sure? That, bu bu nope. Beep, bap, stupid. Unless I say, uh, uh, Siri. Uh, 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 verily, uh, 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 <laughs> Apple Music, uh, uh, new future album. Uh, and these things were solvable five years ago. That I, is the thing is they, they were, they were solvable five years ago, but they didn't. And now Apple's going to be making some other company really, really rich to add these features. I, uh, uh, one of my favorite, uh, I don't know, tricks is uh, one of the things that I find surprises people the most is, they don't realize that uh, uh, GPTs like to be bullied. Like they'll start to make throat clearing noises and it's like, shut up. Yes, you can do that. <laughs> and everybody is always astonished. And it's like, you know what? You're right. I can. And then it does. <laughs> yeah, it is. It is. Uh, yes, you can. Like, I feel like Frazier Crane and you kind of, you will. Um, <laughs> I, I 
a lot that's going to change. A lot of the little tricks that we do to get it to do a thing came about because I explained this before, but like for our listeners here, when you train a model, yeah, what's called the base model, which is you just take a bunch of text, just a huge amount of text, let it learn grammar, rules, all the sort of stuff from it. Then you take that model and then you do another layer of training, which we'll call like, it's called reinforcement learning human feedback, which is basically giving it a bunch of input saying, yes, this, no, not that. And then kind of training it in the format that you have an interaction with chat GPT. So it understands when a user wants something, what it's supposed to do. Okay. Then you give it a layer of, let's say, safety training, where you train the model to make sure it's not going to show you how to make Molotov cocktails or meth or whatever. Okay. So there's several stages of that. Now Unless we're starting it's a hilarious with, scene in a movie that you're writing and you just well, need to. And that's, <laughs> that's often why you have to get around the safety training by saying, yes, no, this is for this purpose, whatever. The way we're training stuff is changing. You know, when I look at, I think, Claude 3, the model by Anthropic, is a really good model. It is, it is to me, I, I think, the first one that excels over GPT-4 and many tasks. Um, they, the thing about the, I know from the people in Anthropic is they think a lot about words and words matter. And I think that the way they changed it, trained it and the, what they did is effective. And I'd say like, try Claude, see what works there. Cause sometimes these things work differently, but like they're, you know, Sam was just on Lex Friedman, a lot of models coming, a lot of things coming. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm still a developer ambassador for OpenAI. Uh, and I can tell you, they are iterating in some things that are cool tricks. Now you won't need interesting how about the trick where we all make picks yo man uh my pick is it's called optimism i like to preach optimism and i encourage other people to not be scared especially when a beloved property tries to emerge into a new format like, say, for example, for 25 years, you've played every iteration of the Fallout franchise. And then the people who did Westworld, a show you didn't like very much, take control of it. But then also it has Baby Billy, Walton Goggins, and then later the voice of Toast of London, Matt Berry in it. Uh, my pick is optimism. What, where is this going to air? The fallout. Uh, I think it's Max. Uh, let, let, let me find out. Oh, so it's uh, it's in it stayed they stayed in the Warner family. This is their new. Their new yeah, family. they they just dropped the trailer. Um, let me show this is turned off. Amazon. Um, People are saying Amazon. Oh yeah, it is Amazon. On now, Prim. Uh, one thing they do is they do combine. You'll notice this gorgeous bright optimistic color combination of the the blue and gold uh both inside the vault and also outside in the world um they have they have the huckster of you know baby billy uh, at the very beginning and then uh he shows up as a uh, i don't know a radiated ghoul who lives a very long time but uh you know, they explain the factions of the Brotherhood of Steel and and you, we have our vault dweller who's confused and cheerful and the whole world is trying to kill her. Um, it looks an awful lot like they got everything right. But but uh, it's been a minute since I've cared about something so much that I understand being scared for it. <laughs> I... <laughs> I it's it's hard to know too because remember when you look at the 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 produ there's a lot of producers on there and and John and Nolan and Lisa Joy are just among some of the others on there. Um, I would say that uh, and in the sh the actual showrunner and it's hard to know what happens. Like the creator of the show, uh, previous screenplay credits were Captain Marvel and the Tomb Raider later. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, it, it also has that one dude from uh, 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 Severance. He's cool. <laughs> He's cool. So many reasons to be optimistic. <laughs> That's why my pick yeah. is optimism. <laughs> um, but the uh, the writer, one of co-writers, Graham Wagner, he worked on Portlandia and Silicon Valley and The Office. And so, so they got jokes. Yeah. And, and so I would say that... Uh, and I, I think that I don't know it's such a mix. It's hard to know. And, and I've liked, I actually kind of grown to like a lot of Westworld and what they did there. Um, 
but yeah, sometimes you look at this and you're, you're like, I don't know who I, I, I've, yeah. So, and, but also like, uh, Todd Howard's list as an EP and Todd Howard's a person that's been shepherding the whole fallout yeah. project. So, I mean, it's, it's a solid story as is evidenced by the fact that I played all five games and the precursors to it before it. Maybe he'll do a little video at the end of every single episode explaining about how, how much, much it's like the game. <laughs> <laughs> well, like and Craig that's, that's the hard part is it, is it video games are really, really hard to translate because the real protagonist is you. And, yeah. and that, that your, your journey through a game is different than necessary. The story that's unfolded in front of you. And it's why even people who've been capable directors who we thought could have been done great, Duncan Jones, you know, World of Warcraft, and you get, man, that was, you know, that was, you know, that was going to be the one, Assassin's Creed, that was going to be the one, and, and, but we have had good adaptations, what's a good adaptation? Uh, the number, the number one most popular video game adaptation uh, before the Mario movie was Tomb Raider, of all things. Yeah, which, well, the, here's the problem, the original Tomb Raider was just a rip off of Indiana Jones. So it's like, they didn't, but, they didn't emulate the game. But they made with like prime Angelina Jolie. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Like that's the pitch, Indiana Jones, but with a beautiful Angelina Jolie done is based on, it. I don't need to hear that. Don't tell me that. I don't need to know that. <laughs> so, uh, we'll see. I think that, you know, um, I was about to say like, yeah, they're like, ah, oh, when they were going to make the boys, but I'm like, nah, I like as much as Seth Rogen sometimes is, can drive me up the wall. He produces really good stuff. Yeah. I mean, you know? I mean and, and, and he, he really got preacher. He really got the boys. He understood why yeah. those things yeah, were good. Invincible yeah. is amazing. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, I got a beer. Yeah. Hey, you guys miss game of Thrones. Remember, remember game of Thrones. I, I I I remember six out of seven parts of it. Yeah. So uh, yesterday I opened Netflix and I saw the three body problem, but I was still oh. so mad about Game of Thrones I skipped right by it, closed <laughs> Netflix, and went to Hulu <laughs> and watched Shogun. If you haven't seen oh, yeah. Shogun, Shogun's really good. It's an FX series. It's based on uh, historical fiction of uh, 1600 era Japan, a feudal conflict that is imbued with uh, uh, the Portuguese Catholics that are, are that have already colonized parts of Japan or are, are involved in it, uh, involved in the power structure. And the first Protestant, he is kind of the straw that stirs the drink in our in our narrative. But uh, if if the things you liked about Game of Thrones were cool, compelling characters that lived in a very real but very brutal world with customs and codes that are are uh, uh, you know ironclad but strange and brutal. Uh, boy, do I got something for you! It's called Shogun, and uh, uh, I have enjoyed the I think the first three or four episodes that we that we watched so far. So, a uh, little little background on that. Um, I uh, remember watching the 1980 miniseries about that, and then somewhere along, you know, looking for something to read, I decided to dig into the original book by James Clavell, which was based on Shogun. Right? Um, he wrote an entire saga called the Asian Saga, which had Shogun, and then it takes it basically Noble goes House. kind of like. Yeah, you get Shogun. Yeah, you get yeah, you get Taipan. Then you get Gaijin, King Rat, Noble House, etc. Um, and uh, and I guess more. I don't really like this falling up to like Vietnam War and stuff. But like, I really really enjoyed the the audiobook, and I've heard nothing but great things about this because one of the things that becomes apparent to you is like um, that period of Japan, very different, very <laughs> very very different. Very different. And and when you start thinking about you start watching Star Trek and stuff and these alien contact stories, and it ain't even nearly as weird and strange as the rules are. And that's what I loved about that. Yeah. Uh, 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 thing that happens in the first 10 minutes, if you haven't watched it, uh, uh, I will encourage you. A character steps out of line uh, and uh, apolo- because of where he did it, apologizes, says he'll kill himself. And the, the superior says, no, 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 no. Don't worry. We'll just we'll just kill your child. And he's like, thank you. <laughs> and then they do. 
<laughs> and it's yeah. like it's like okay we're we're oh. in a very different world than than anything that we have that we have come come to understand uh uh and then you mix in the the the, the protestant and catholic element the questions of exactly where our main character's loyalties lie a lot of really good stuff good good character stuff yeah cool looking forward to that uh I'm going to need like seven my, people to tell me that the three body problem is good before I even watch a single frame. I'm still so annoyed. I, mean, I, mean, I, I, I made it through a book and a half on that one. Well, uh, yeah, I, I made it through the book, a book. And, <laughs> I felt, I, and let me caveat. I have friends that love it. So I know it's an Andrew problem. This is an Andrew problem. It is not a book problem. But I'm like. It is a shared problem, uh, for the it, record. It, it 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 is. I love the deep science fiction in there, and this, but it was like a man. We took a long ways to get to here, but people love it. Like I, I, I it's like, it's there's some like was a fantasy one. I forget what it was, like name of the wind or whatever, like that or something. I'm like, I'm like, we're like three flashbacks within the narrative. <laughs> like I'm so confused, but other people love it. And I believe, I believe that it is, these are great works. I believe they're great works. They're just not for me or, you know, Brian in the case of this too. Um, I'm excited because I think the premise is really cool. It's, it's a premise I played with a long time. It's like, you know, the, I don't spoil everybody, but it was a thing of like, what if, and this happened and, and this is, I was excited. Like, Oh, somebody took this and really went into a very interesting path with it. So, We'll see. I mean, it, we could. There, you know. I, I, I don't know. My, my beef is just with the abject fatalism of it, where it's like uh, they discover that there exists aliens somewhere else, and then it's like uh, all of humanity is like, well, we're all screwed. <laughs> the end. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, it's a. They had a big 3D projection thing at South by. I was walking back home from South by and I saw it's like this gigantic countdown and then this big, awesome 3D projection. And then it was like three body problem. And I just started booing. Boo. You well, will answer for your by, crimes of ruining the last two seasons of Game of Thrones. <laughs> we have not yeah. forgotten. You should love your body. I mean, there's a, apparently like they, there was like a presentation on the AI and people booed. <laughs> Um, All right, I, this this feels like a good time for us to wrap it well, up. Well, no, Andrew has to do his pick. Sorry, I I I I, I stepped on him. Uh, yeah, let me go to let me grab one of my favorite YouTube channels because that's my primary of consuming information about the world. Um, and let me go to doo -doo 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 -doo. I'm gonna pull up something. I, I watch so much YouTube, like that is like my default way of getting information about the world. Uh, by the way, the new Penguin trailer dropped. Haven't seen it yet, but looking forward to that and oh for the for the the max series yeah yeah which which i'm tentatively interested in seeing how yeah. it turns off i like the batman um, i like the batman movie i really liked it a little yeah. long but i really liked it so one of my favorite um youtubers when it comes to movie stuff is the guy that does the this pitch meeting have you watched those? Oh yeah, um, <laughs> uh, oh, uh, uh, Ryan, what's his name? Uh, where they're super, super fast, and he he yeah. just uh, just eviscerates everything by describing yeah, accurately what yeah. the pitch meeting yeah. was like. <laughs> Ryan George. Yeah. So it's it's. I mean, do you want to play just a little bit of an audio for one? Because I think yeah, sure, so, sure. He is he is a guy that is when we talk about people who. He now goes and takes his older videos and he'll go do them and he'll give them his notes on this. And one of his notes is like, I learned to be faster, I learned to be more jokes. You watch the all evolution right, so of this guy. Been selling tools. Okay, so here's here's him explaining how tools got their names. This is on the front page of his channel. For a while here. now, and for marketing purposes, corporate feels that we should, you know, name some of these things. That makes sense. Yeah, well, so Larry, you had this thing assigned to you. What do you think we should call this? I thought we could name that a wrench, which means a violent twist or pull. That works for me. I like that a lot. Daniel, you had this thing. What do we, what do you want to, what, what do we call that? Drill. A drill. Okay, I like that a lot. We're on a roll. Now, David, you had this thing with the flat face and the things coming out the back. What do you got? 
not for me. Oh, uh, yeah, no, I definitely, I did come up with the name because that's what you, you asked me to do that. Good, yeah, what is it? What is the, yeah, no, that's a great question. The, que the answer, the name is the, um, ha hammer. A hammer? A <laughs> uh, hammer, yeah, I think we could all agree that that's a good name. What kind of sandwich is that, David? Oh, this sandwich, yeah, this is probably chicken. It smells a lot like ham, David. Oh, yeah, no, it's, cr well, you know, it's crazy how some sandwiches smell these days. Okay, I'm writing it down, but we're going to have a talk later, okay? Now, Alex, you had this sharp thing on a stick. Alex. What? Alex. Are you saying Axe, or are you saying your own name in a weird way? Alex. Okay, I'm going to write Axe. <laughs> I feel like corporate will go for that. Now, Steve, you had this thing right here. What do you think we should call this? Screwdriver. Screwdriver. Okay, yeah, that's definitely catchy. Yeah, it came to me after I caught my chauffeur with my whore of a wife. Oh, my God. <laughs> if you need an alternate, we could also go with Bang Mailman. She thought that was good, too, apparently. What are you drinking? I put some vodka and some orange juice. I don't even care anymore. Is that a thing? And you know what? I'm calling it a screwdriver, too. Does that make you happy? That doesn't make any sense. Okay, he's in a bad headspace. We should probably move on. Rufus, you had this thing. Thing. What do you got for me back there, buddy? Crowbar. <laughs> okay, don't really want to get on your bad side, so that works for me. What did you come up with? Me? Yeah, you were assigned this big electric thing that goes like... Doo -doo 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 -doo. Oh, I, uh, um, um, a uh, hammer. No, hammer's already taken, Jack. You need your own name. Oh, my own name? Okay, well, Jack Hammer. That's not what it... You know what? <laughs> Fine. Well, hey, if he's getting his name on a tool, I want my name on a tool. What was your tool again? I had this little freaking, this bendy thing. Do you mind if he piggybacks off yours? That's fine. Okay, so Alan Wrench. Now, who had this thing? <laughs> that was me. Did you come up with a name? I did. I thought we could call that a saw. Okay, well, see, that might be confusing because that's a conjugation of a super common verb that people use every day. I think it'll be fine. This will also be a verb too, by the way. It'll mean to use this tool. Well, okay, but what if someone sees the tool and then later wants to tell somebody about having done that? Well, then they'll have seen a saw. That's not a problem. Yes, but also they saw a saw. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, and if they saw it in action, they saw a saw saw. Well, what's the big deal if someone saw a saw sign? You also have to consider if someone saws through a jar of salsa. Why would someone saw salsa? Well, I don't know, but that would mean that they saw a saw saw salsa. Well, I think it's a great name, even if someone saw 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 salsa. You know what? I'm going to buy some salsa and saw salsa. So just to say I saw, 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 saw. Okay, you know what? We really got to get this over to corporate. So let's just, you know, that's a saw. That's fine. Now let's just wrap things up, okay? Alex. Yeah, that's not helpful, Alex. Okay, final thing on the agenda for the day. Kevin is out sick. Did anyone come up with a name for his tool? What was his tool again? It was this weird gardening thing here. Uh oh! Okay, Steve, I think maybe you should go home. But also, yeah, that's perfect. Uh, his, his, his pitch are great because he breaks down movies, right? It's, it's so watching... good. Yeah, the pitch meetings are my favorite. Those are great. Like the pitch meetings were the, like, how did this movie get made? Morbius or whatever. And then he just takes these things apart in such a way. And uh, he's like, you know, well, that like, seems stupid. He's like, it is. <laughs> and then yeah, he keeps yeah. on going. <laughs> yeah. yeah, tight. All right. Like, yeah. Um, because murdering children's tight. What? Uh, forget what I said. Anyhow, yeah. So uh, Ryan George, I think he's hey. hilarious. Watching this guy evolve over the years is great. Um, so if you go look at pitch meeting, on YouTube, uh, you will laugh. My, I can't watch these without my wife because she wants to watch them too because they're so funny. So great to Ryan George. All right, how's it been? It's been after. Metaphorically. Killing the stream. Mm -hmm.